thank you, everybody. We're at 249 people. Thank you again, Michael, for, for being here with us. I'm going to pass, um, pass it over to Camille McKinney, the ICF Los Angeles immediate past president. Awesome. So, Nanor, can you uh, show us the slides, please? Thank you so much. Well, again, we are so thrilled that all of you have joined us. I'm looking 251 so far. So this is terrific. And, you know, it's been a labor of love. I've had the best time working with my three partners at the other chapters. If you go ahead and show us the other slide, the next slide, please. Just to show you guys, you know, which chapters are sponsoring this event for you. Again, I'm uh, Camille McKinney from ICF Los Angeles. I'm the immediate past president, as well as uh, Petra Russell from Orange County. Wave to him, Petra. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi. Okay. <laughs> we also had Natalia Harm from the uh, Washington State chapter, and Charlene Roberts was our. Uh, connection for the Vancouver uh, chapter. So we're thrilled. It was so much fun to work together on this. Um, I want to thank Michael for suggesting it because all four of our chapters reached out to him individually. And he thought, well, why don't y'all just get together and do it and we'll have one big event. And so we're like, okay, we can do that. So it's been a lot of fun. So I want to thank you guys very much. Um, before we get started, I want to, one thing I want to say, I know we noticed that a few people from Texas have been on the call and we want to, you know, give our hearts to you and know that please, you know, please know that we're thinking about you. We know that you've been through a lot in the last few days and continue to really persevere through uh, what you're going through. So we just wanted to let you know that we're thinking about you and other states are certainly being, you know, the entire country is being really impacted. Um, and the West Coast, we're doing okay, but uh, we want you to know that we're thinking about you. Thank you so much. And I'd like to turn it over to Petra Russell, who, are, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Camille. And this is the best part, right? Yes. <laughs> it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you all um, leadership author, speaker, and facilitator, as well as researcher Michael Bangay-Stenier, or MBS for short, who has a mission to help people be a force of change. He is on the forefront of shaping how organizations around the world make being coach-like an essential leadership competency. He is also the founder of Box of Crayons, a learning and development company helping organizations unleash the power of curiosity. He's the author of various books, including the best-selling book and coaching the century, The Coaching Habit, and his latest, The Advice Trap, of which we will hear a little bit more tonight. In nine, uh, 2019, Michael was named the number one thought leader in coaching, first Canadian coach of the year and the global coaching guru since 2014. Yay. <laughs> uh, originally from Australia, Michael went to Oxford University in England to be a Rhodes Scholar. And um, I believe as the story goes, married a Canadian and so lives Thank now you. in Toronto, which is where he's joining us tonight from. He can be found at, at mbs.works or boxofcrayons.com. And without further ado, I hand it over to you, Michael, and thank you again so very much for being here with us today. My total pleasure. Thank you for that introduction, Petra. And Petra and I are going to be talking as we go through the next hour or so together. But to all of you, thank you for so much for being here. I know life is busy. It's one thing to sign up for something like this. It's another thing to show up for it. So you're awesome for showing up. I really appreciate it. If you haven't got it already, pen and paper, because you're going to be working on some stuff. I've got some ideas for you, but... I'm never one for just a download of content. I'm always wanting you to engage with it, to be interactive. We're also going to be using the chat box like crazy weasels. So get ready to kind of be sharing stuff as much as you want to in your chat box. Now, this is called about taming your advice monster. Here's my not very sophisticated slide deck, taming your advice monster. And we're going to start by actually just kind of centering ourselves and getting our heads in the game. So here's the question I've got for you. And I'd love to see your answer in the chat box, please. On a scale of one to seven, how focused do you plan to be with me tonight? How focused do you plan to be? 
one is completely unfocused. You know, it's chaos. The kids are fighting. Something's on fire over there. There's a herd of wildebeest sweeping through the back there. And honestly, you're just here for background noise while you deal with the chaos. Seven, on the other hand, you're bringing full attention to what's going on. You've cleared the deck. You've got your noise-canceling headphones on. You've locked the kids in another room. I'm not sure what it is for you. And I'm seeing sixes and sevens, fives and sixes. Look, I don't mind. The choice is entirely yours. I, I want you just to be aware of how focused you'd like to be. And then here's what I, my, my suggestion is. Make one change to your environment to give yourself a better chance of hitting that number. Because webinars are notoriously easy to get distracted from. Personally, I've always got this kind of need to check email. So you might put your phone out of reach. You might close down a browser. You might move your mouse out of the way. You might put something in a drawer. But just make one adjustment to your environment to kind of put your, set yourself up so you can hit the number you want to hit. And, um, and I will say this, because I'll do a little bit of meta commentary as we go through this, because I do things that I'm hoping that you'll take and adapt and steal in the way that you work with your clients or if you're a presenter. I think it's really helpful at the start of almost any interaction to ask a question like, how focused do you plan to be? Or how much risk are, willing, are you willing to take? Or how engaged would you like to be? It invites people to think about how they're showing up because most of the time, even for scheduled sessions like a coaching session or a webinar like this, people don't really know why they're there. <laughs> they're like, it's just said to be here. It said they to be here in my calendar. I hit the Zoom link. And they're like, they're in passive mode. And what I've done is I've invited you to be more active, more an active participant. And of course, that speaks to the essence of coaching, which is how do we show up in an adult, adult conversation and do something interesting together? So there's a, there's the kind of meta commentary behind this. Now, we've got, what, 300 coaches nearly here? Amazing. And so we're all one way or another connected to this idea of why we coach and that we're happy to be coaches and offering that gift and that service to the world. But here's the question I've got for you. In a sentence, and in the chat box, I'd love to see this. Why do you coach? Why do you coach? I've got an answer for you, and I'm going to share my answer in just a second about you know the outcome that I'm particularly going for, um, how I most broadly, I guess, define success. I'm curious to know, why do you coach? We've got some great stuff coming through here, making a difference to empowering others. Hey, Petra, let me call on you because I want to chat to you about it. I know you're a coach as well, as well as being the director of special events. Why do you coach? How do you articulate that? I think the, the short answer would be to help people unlock their untapped potential. Beautiful. And yeah, really fantastic. see something come out that they didn't think or see before. That's great. And, and you may not know this, but that's really close to how Sir John Whitmore, one of the great grandfathers of coaching, described coaching as well, which is like to unlock people's potential, to help them learn rather than to teach them is the way that, that he described it. So lots of really helpful stuff coming through in the chat box. And I'm getting you to be so busy in the chat box because I want us to tap the collective wisdom of 300 really smart people here. So sure, listen to me. But keep an eye on the chat box as well, because there are things there that you might like to take and borrow language, insights that are there in the chat box so we can learn from each other. I'll tell you why, how I most broadly describe why I coach and why I'm involved in coaching as a profession and as an educator in this world. I think I want to be a catalyst of change. I actually want things to be different as a result of the coaching that I do. I want the people to be different and I want the world to be different. You know, I, I just watched a great Ted talk the other day from a woman called Jacqueline Novogratz. She has a new book out called a manifesto for a moral revolution. And at the heart of that book, she says, what if we could give more to the world than we take? And I love that. It's like, Oh, why didn't I write that? Why didn't I say that first? But I think part of being a catalyst for change, helping people be a force for change in my case, is an essence to why we coach. We, if we're just having a good conversation, it's perfectly pleasant, but we haven't, nothing's happened. Nobody's gonna keep paying you if nothing happens. So how do you be a catalyst for change? Not just for your clients, but for yourself. Because of course, 
part of the reason you're here, I mean, one reason you're here is for my lightweight Australian banter. Another reason is for the CCEs, but really it's also like you can change yourself so you can change your clients who will in turn change you. But if you're committed like I am to change, you have to understand what change is. And I think most of us have a unformed understanding of change and I wanna make it a little more nuanced. And I think there are two fundamental different types of change, particularly when we're working with individuals. I think there's easy change and there's hard change. There's my shorthand for it. Easy change and hard change. And if you don't know the difference between the two, you're probably applying the wrong remedies to support the people in your life, your clients and everybody else who you sprinkle coaching magic dust over. You're probably using the wrong, the wrong tool to try and unlock what's in front of you. So easy change versus hard change. So let me explain what the, um, oh, and Louise, I'm seeing somebody saying, could you turn your video off, Petra? The problem yep. is, Petra, you're, you're too good looking and you're, you're take, everyone's looking at you instead of me and clearly everybody should be looking at me. So come on, people, focus. So let me talk about the difference between easy change and hard change. Now, easy change, you already get. So easy change, you know how to do it, but I'll, I'll tell you kind of what the process looks like. It looks a bit like this. You start somewhere and you go through a process of knowing and doing and knowing and doing. You, you learn something, you, know, you read a book or you talk to a coach or you listen to a podcast or you uh, watch a YouTube video and then you practice a bit and that teaches you a little bit and that means you know a little bit more and maybe you watch the next video in the series and then you do a bit more. And you kind of go through that process enough till you finally get to a place where you go, I'm, that's good enough. I've achieved the level of mastery that um, is appropriate for this situation about where I am right now. So you master easy change all the time. You're on, an, you do it, you're on a, basically on a day-to-day -day basis. So I want you to look around you and I want you to name that. So in the chat box, Share an easy change success that you've had in the last week or two. Something where you're like, you know what? This needs to be a bit different. So you figured it out and you tinkered it with it a bit and you adjusted it and then you, you kind of adjusted it and you're like, okay, this is now an easy change thing that I do. So making dinner, cleaning the kitchen, switching to decaf, excellent closets, stretching exercises, lifting weights, waking up earlier, making great espresso. I love that. I'm an espresso drinker myself. Changing the ink in my printer. Exactly. Hiking and walking, raising money for a nonprofit, getting on the elliptical, daily movement, getting back to running, uh, uh, updating the training, become, uh, updating software, uh, recycling paper in the bathroom, QuickBooks. <laughs> Good for you, Diane. Uh, new recipes. Exactly. So when they say, oh, change is hard, Look at all the evidence to say change isn't hard. You know, there's a whole swathe of change where you're like, you know what? It's just a question of getting down to it, rolling up the sleeves, going, all right, let me figure this out. And you can do that and you've done that. That's easy change. But let's talk about hard change. This is the rub. This is the tricky bit because we've all faced hard change and the frustration of hard change because hard change starts in the same place, easy change. It's like, here I am, and here's the destination that I'd like to get to. But the journey doesn't look like that at all. It looks more like this. <laughs> you set off and you read some books and you watch some podcasts and you're like, okay, I think I get it. And you then you can't, you can't get any traction and you try a few times and it doesn't really stick and you muddle along and you make mistakes and you give up and you go back and you go, oh, why am I doing this again? And you kind of get irritated with the person you're married to or hanging out with. And then you, and, and then next year you make the same new year's resolution and next year at work, you get the same performance review. And there's one part of you going, what's going on here? Because I actually want to master this. <laughs> I actually want to get better at this. And it, for whatever reason, I don't seem to be able to get my head around how to actually make this work. And I think because you're facing a fundamentally different type of change, because whereas with easy change, the cycle was, I'll just pull this up again, know and do and know and do and know and do. I think with hard change, when it works, because you've also mastered hard change, I think it looks more like this. It's a change of being. 
which feeds into the doing, which feeds into the being, which changes into the doing. It's less about the knowledge. It's more about the wiring of who you are. And as I'll say a bit later on, trying to add more knowledge to solve a hard change problem basically never works. So let me just check in with you. Look around for you. And as honest as you want to be, you know, how much risk do you want to take here? But as vulnerable as you'd like to be, share a hard change challenge that's in your life right now. Something that's just banging your head against a little bit. You know, frustrating is hard. So losing weight is a classic one. Writing is a classic one. Getting emotional eating, writing a book, exercise, co-parenting, figuring out my bread or brand. I'm not sure, going too fast. Uh, changing jobs. Uh, healing from trauma, for sure, that's deep. Um, website content, feeling confident, relating to a teenager, um, eating right, fantastic, feeling comfortable in a new relationship. So much good stuff here. I really appreciate you sharing this. Uh, you barely know me and look at this great vulnerability. It's really wonderful. Taxes, exactly. Not judging myself and others, uh, creating safety for myself, shifting my career. Here's what's amazing, actually, with this list. It's almost the same as the list we had for easy change. There's certainly a really big overlap between the two. I saw somebody in easy change go QuickBooks and I saw somebody in hard change go taxes. It's the same. So there's nothing inherent easy change or hard change in any one topic. It is just kind of our wiring and how we deal with it and how we face it and how we address it. You know, I saw a number of you like writing a book as hard change. And that's a classic because how many people have gone, you know, I should write a book one day. I, I will just say off the record, if you're thinking of writing a book, really think hard about it because it's such a miserable, long, painful experience that takes forever. And then almost nobody ends up reading books unless you get lucky. So think, think you may want to think again around <laughs> take it, writing a book, but it's a classic. And you've, you've read um, Stephen King on how to write. You've read Annie Lamott on Bird by Bird. You've signed up for Masterclass and you've watched Malcolm Gladwell talk about writing and you've watched um, uh, Margaret Atwell talking about how to do writing. And, you, and you've, you've bought pencils and you bought a journal and then you bought a pad and then you bought another pad. And then you wrote it, tried to write it, sat at this desk for a while and then you sat at that desk for a while. And, hell <laughs> for some reason you still can't write a book and it's like what is going on with this and it really is a fundamental way of thinking about what change we're doing here here's a couple of metaphors that might work for you i think easy change is like downloading an app onto your phone you figured out a useful piece of content and you're adding it to what's already there i think hard change is requiring an upgrade to your operating system. It's a rewiring. And of course, and you know this, because you've done this. I mean, I saw some of you had like exercising as a hard change thing. My bet is that a bunch of you have downloaded somewhere between five and 12 different exercise apps going, this will be the app that will crack my exercise thing. It's the five minute exercise. It's the three minute exercise app. It's the 42 second exercise app. It's the five hours a day. You've got all the apps and none of them are helping. So easy change, downloading the app, hard change, operating system. Another way to think about it is this. Easy change is U plus, hard change is U 2.0. Easy change is additive. It's polishing and adding to what's already there. And that's important, that's useful. Um, but hard change is often transformative. You're really going, who do I want to be when I grow up? What's the next, how do I level up here? How do I transform from, and I say this in the, the Advice Trap book, from present you to future you. And hard change is about tackling, um, tackling uh, future you. And I'll say it again, because I really want you to hear it. If you're dealing with hard change for yourself, but of course for your clients as well, more information never helps just never helps. And don't, aren't you tempted to give people more information when you see your client struggling with something and you're like, oh, I have, I have a perfect book for you. 
you should definitely buy Michael's book, you're saying. I'm like, maybe not. <laughs> you should have you, do you know this model? Have you seen this video? Let me teach you this thing. And the thing is that just won't work. That will just become another failed attempt to try and crack this process. So I really wanted to lay this out. I know this webinar is called How to Tame Your Advice Monster. And we're gonna get into that in just a second. But what I'm really teaching you, this is the foundational piece of teaching is understanding the difference between easy change and hard change, because that may transform the way you approach your coaching with the people you work with, and it may uh, transform your own work on yourself in terms of as you continue to grow. Let me check what's been most useful or most valuable for you so far. Anybody who's read my coaching habit book knows that that's the learning question. And I ask it all the time, all the time. And I'm asking it for three reasons. And I'll tell you why I ask it. So you're seeing them. This is the meta commentary. I'm asking it so that you can see the wisdom in the room here so that you can see what everybody else is learning. And maybe they're saying it in a way that resonates for you. So this shared understanding and shared articulation of the learning is really powerful. Secondly, I'm asking you to write it down so that it registers for you. I'm getting you to kind of register this and repeat it in your own brain so you have a better chance of remembering this. It's also a way of clearing the cache. So like you can be fresh and ready to hear what the next thing is I want to teach you. Because otherwise, honestly, I'd be pouring more wine. I'd be pouring wine into a full wine glass. And it's like, it's just making my, staining my carpet. That's not going to help. So this is kind of getting you fresh and clearing the cash and getting you ready for the next piece of teaching. And also I'm doing this because it makes me look good. If I'm really blunt about it, you know, at the end of this, I'm going to ask you, or somebody's going to ask you, what did you think of Michael's webinar? And I will have asked you three times, what was most useful or most valuable? And it's almost impossible for you to get to the end of the webinar and, and think to yourself, that was utterly unuseful because you've thought it, others have thought it, you've all said it. So I'm making sure that you extract the value of the webinar by being primed to say, this is a valued webinar. I'm manipulating you. I absolutely am, but in service of you making sure that this is a, a webinar that feels and lands in a useful way for you. I didn't even see all the stuff that came through here. I'm so grateful. I'm, I mean, I love seeing it all. Um, and maybe I'll be a chance to read it later, but lots of good stuff coming through here. More info never helps with hard change, says Carol. Exactly. 306 of us taking in, says Camille. Exactly. It's pretty cool. All right. Here's my belief about heart, taming your advice monster. Let's get into taming your advice monster. I think for most of us, taming your advice monster is hard change. Now, it's, it's a mix. I mean, honestly, as coaches, we've been trained to ask questions. But admit it. Don't you just want to tell people what to do sometimes? <laughs> And look, I'm actually a coach who doesn't believe that the only way to coach is ask questions and never give advice and never teach. I think there's absolutely um, a time and a place for doing exactly that. What we're trying to manage with your advice monster is when you're giving advice as a reaction rather than as a deliberate decision to say, this is the appropriate intervention with this person right now. Because this is what the advice monster does. It leaps up and it takes control of the situation. And before you know it, you're offering up your awesome ideas, suggestions, opinions, advice, solutions. And you're like, oh, <laughs> rats. I'm a coach. I'm meant to ask a question instead. So the behavior that I try and teach in coaches, but actually almost in everybody I, I teach, is I'm just trying you to stay curious a little bit longer. Rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly. That's the core behavior that I think improves relationships, <laughs> just all relationships. You could just stay curious a little bit longer and rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly. It's just going to make for a better world. So let me introduce to you the three advice monsters. Actually, before I do that, I want to call Petra up. I meant to do this and I forgot. Hey, Petra, um, I'll have you uh, pull your video up and get off mute. And let me ask you this. What felt most useful for you in that first section that we covered? What landed? The easy change versus hard change, the Good. additive versus the uh, really the 2.0, right? You, you really got to turn into something that's like above the level that you're at right now. 
that's, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you. I'm sorry, I meant to call you in earlier. And I <laughs> got too excited by the sound of my own voice, which is definitely ironic considering that I'm talking about talking less. <laughs> All right. So um, I'll get you to jump off the video and off mute and back on mute and we'll get into these three advice monsters. Let me introduce them to you. Tell it, save it and control it. Those are the three advice monsters. Or maybe they're just the one advice monster who wears three different sets of clothing. I haven't quite figured this out. Maybe it's the three different personas of one advice monster. So whatever works best for you, but tell it, save it and control it. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to go through each one of these. And then at the end, I'm going to, <laughs> Camille is saying it's National Drink Wine Day. Camille, every day is National Drink Wine Day at the Bungay Stania household. So it's just a party all the time. Um, I'm going to talk about each one of these. We'll go through them one by one. And then I'm going to ask you at the end, which of the three advice monsters is feels most real for you, most kind of likely to seize the wheels and take control for you. So let's talk about tell it. Tell it is the noisiest and most obvious of the advice monsters. It has convinced you that the way you add value is to have the answer and really to have all the answers. In fact, to have all the answers to all the things all the time. And if you don't have all the answers to all the things, you're failing. You're, you're, you're betraying your role as a coach or as a parent or as an employee or as a leader. You're failing the people around you who go, that's your job is to have the answers to this. And you're letting everybody down. And of course, I hope you're hearing when I say that, I set the standard that your job is to have all the answers to all the things all the time. You realize that that's impossible. It is impossible for you to have all the answers. And we'll talk about why in just a second. I will say this, the only answers that you have that are really good, I can actually look up on Google a whole lot quicker than you can tell me. But here's a fundamental understanding about why, we, why our advice wants to take control. That behavior has both prizes and punishments. That's what these symbols stand for, prizes and punishments. This is one of the, the foundational tools that I use in my life and in my work. Every choice you make has prizes and punishments. If you can stop and articulate the prizes and punishments for each choice, you're likely to be better able to make a better choice. Now, as an aside, some people don't like the language prizes and punishments. It's a bit too, much, too extreme or something for them. And that's fine. You can find your own language. I like it because I like the alliteration, the Ps. And I like, I like that it's a bit more visceral. It's a bit more kind of vivid. You know, pros and cons is a bit theoretical and intellectual and legalistic. Prizes and punishments feels more real to me. So each behavior has prizes and punishments. So let me ask you this in the chat box, and I'm going to call Petra up to answer this with me as well. What do you think the prizes are? What's the benefit to you of letting your tell it advice monster get loose? How does that help you win when your tell it is, is on the way? Feel smart, your ego for sure feeds the ego. It feels easy. You're adding value. Exactly. You're rescuing. It's very nice. Evading risk, satisfying control. Petro, there's lots of good stuff coming through here. What, what would you add, if anything? Uh, in this quick moment, I can really say it's it's probably ego, right? You you really yeah. want to add value. You said it before. I mean, that's really what drives this, I think, for, for most of us. Yeah. It's like, look at me, I know stuff. Look at me, I've still got it. If you're an old person like me, you're like, look, see, I'm old, but I still know stuff. You young people out there, ah! right? So there's status, there's authority, there's kind of like, I'm, I'm the important person here. It's kind of nice having people coming to ask you for advice. It means that you know, these gray hairs that we've, some of us have got, you're like, I've, I've earned this. Look at, look at my wisdom here, for sure. So lots of stuff coming through, which is like, I'm still relevant. I'm adding value. But what I am what I am going to offer up with these prizes is that I'm calling them hashtag wins, not wins. Because you can see and you can feel, right, as you write this down and you see this great stuff coming through in the chat, that what you're noticing there is um, it's short term. It's kind of more about protecting you. 
It's about maintaining your status and your control and your privilege and your authority and the, the status quo, all of those things and the, and, the, and the power dynamic, all of those things often get maintained and controlled by what you're seeing here, by the prizes, the wins, not wins of the talent advice monster. Now, against all of this, you are to weigh the punishments. And the way I would ask that question is, so what is the price being paid by you and by others when your talent advice monster is on the loose? What's the price being paid by you and by others? I stay dependent, yep, dependence. Stifling my client, very nice. Stopping creating, shortchanging, loss of magic, no aha, little growth, disempowering, loss of connection, no creativity, uh, trust issues, bottlenecking for sure, um, reduces their creativity. Hey, Petra, come on, come on for me. And tell me what you think. I'm going to keep you on. I'm going to keep you on as we go through these three advice monsters. We'll I keep think the, video the biggest on the problem life. when you <laughs> come out with stuff is you turn. You know, you you start the guide stuff, or you what what you could say in coaching. You become like the helping bully, right? Right. I haven't heard that phrase, but I love it. The helping bully, because <laughs> you're being helpful in inverted right. commas. Which is not that helpful. I'm going to tell you three reasons specifically about why the tell it tactic it often goes astray. And I will just say this, I want to reiterate it. There is a place for advice. There is a place for teaching. There is a place for ideas. There's a place for guidance. It's just not quite as soon as most of us offer it up. And too often we do it in reaction to, and, a, and as a kind of instinctive habit rather than a deliberate intervention saying, this is the most useful way that I can serve right now. But I think, and I'm just in some ways articulating what you've already said in the chat box so brilliantly. Here are the three reasons why advice is not that helpful. Number one, you're solving the wrong problem because you've been seduced into thinking that the first challenge that they show up with is the real challenge. And so often it's not the real challenge. And what I, what's lovely talking with coaches is you just know this. You know, that's part of our work is going, look, my... I think as a coach, if you can reframe your work as my job is to help people figure out what the real problem is, then you become infinitely valuable to your clients. Because honestly, they can find solutions everywhere. But until they figure out what the real challenge is, they, they're, they're, not, they're not working on the right thing. So I think part of the problem with the first rush of advice is it's often solving the wrong problem because you haven't done the work to really think it through and if, if any of you who have the coaching habit book know one of my favorite questions is what's the real challenge here for you? The way of really helping focus that conversation. Second thing, second reason your advice doesn't work is honestly, your advice just is not as good as you think it is. And if you do any reading around cognitive biases and as coaches, you should know about cognitive biases. There's just, there's like a thousand cognitive biases that just make you think you're better than you actually are. And that is super helpful a lot of the time. But in terms of actually believing that our advice is actually fantastic, it just, it just honestly isn't. It's a bit dated. It's a bit uh, biased. It's colored by your own experience. You haven't understood the problem anyway. So the, the, the advice is off base. Um, and and this, it's just not nuanced or subtle or appropriate so often. So there's number two. But number three, and um, this is the kind of the bigger challenge is um, it's not the right act of leadership. And I do think that if you're in a coaching relationship with somebody, either formally or informally, you can frame that as an, an act of leadership, which is to say, even if you know what the real challenge is, even if you're really clear what the hard problem is that needs to be cracked, and even if you have a stonkingly good idea, you're like, it's gold dust, it's a pearl. It's magic. The question you've got to ask yourself is, what's, what's the bigger win here? Me being the person who jumps in and solves it and offers up this brilliant solution that solves the problem, or is it to allow them to figure this stuff out themselves? And that's not a rhetorical question because there are times when the right thing to do is for you to jump in with the answer. But I think it is a question to ask yourself, which is, is this actually 
the thing you want to do? Is this actually the right intervention? You know, um, the, uh, I've temporarily forgotten his name, but the guy who took over the CEO of, uh, Alan Mulally, took over the uh, role of CEO of Ford. Uh, this is in the financial crisis where Ford was losing like billions of dollars every month. And he's the first person outside the Ford family to take on the role of CEO. And can you imagine the pressure of like, <laughs> you're losing like, you know, like $25 million a day or something ridiculous. Um, you'd be so tempted to start giving orders and telling people what to do. And he just waited not weeks, but months till finally people at those lower levels beneath him started finding their own solutions. Because he said, my job is to unleash the power of this leadership group, you not know, to become the bottleneck. And I always think if Alan Mulally can pull that off when he's got the whole of the world looking at him for a publicly traded company called Ford, we can probably do it with our family, with our friends, with our clients and with each other. All right, let's tell it. You did that brilliantly. Let's talk about save it. The second of the advice monsters. Save it is a little bit um, more subtle than tell it. Save it's put its arm around you and going, you know what? Your job is to protect everybody. Don't let anybody struggle or stumble or fail or find it difficult or get lost. Your job is to make sure that nobody ever trips or skins their knee. Your job is to rescue everybody all of the time. And if you're not rescuing everybody all of the time, if you're not keeping everybody safe from everything, then obviously they're failing, but you're failing as well. Oh man, <laughs> what a heavy burden that is. I will just say for the record that I am ch happily child-free. So I feel for all your parents because I think the save it monster can feel strong when you're in the parenting role. But let's talk about prizes and punishments. What are the prizes? What are the benefits to being the save it when the save it person is in control of you? What do you get from that? What are the, the hashtag wins, not wins there? You're the hero, the ego again, security, yep, being the hero, being needed, feeling good, control. That's really perceptive from uh, whoever wrote control, uh, Rachel. Because that, that rescuing role is very subtly about having your fingers in everybody else's pie, or maybe not that subtly. It's, a, it's quite a controlling act, the rescuer thing. Um, uh, Megan's asking me to type the hashtag. So I'm just going to see if I can do that. Wins, not wins. There we go. There's my go at a hashtag. Uh, manipulative. Yeah, getting your own way. Fantastic. So I think if you're in this, the benefit is like you feel like you're a hero. You feel like you're the savior. Even better, you get to kind of take on often the role of the, the, the martyr. It's like, look at me opening my veins for my family and for my team and for my organization. Is there no end to which I won't suffer just to make other people feel better? So you've got that kind of moral righteousness about how noble you are compared to everybody else and how self-sacrificing you are compared to everybody else. Um, but of course, you're also protecting everybody and wrapping up a cotton wool. And you know, is that saying wisdom enters through the wound? And I think that's quite profound. Um, and if you're not letting anybody skin their knee, then nobody gets smarter. You know, there's a, a years ago, a guy called Mike Abrashoff wrote a book called um, My Ship. I think he's, a, he's a, Navy, a US Navy captain. But I loved his distinction. He said, look, there are two types of mistakes. There are above the waterline mistakes and there are below the waterline mistakes. And your job as captain is definitely to stop the below the waterline mistakes because then the ship sinks and everybody's in trouble. But your job is as best you can to allow the above the waterline mistakes because that's how people get smarter. That's how people learn. And if you're in save it mode, nobody gets to have that experience. So it's exhausting for you and it's stifling for others. There's a, I mean, we, we started to talk about this. What, what's the punishments? What's the price you pay and the price others pay if save it is in control? I've already given you some language around that, but I'm curious to know what you'd add to it. Yeah, exhaustion, <laughs> exhaustion and burnout, burnout and exhaustion. You know, a related model to this that I teach sometimes is the drama triangle, the Cartman drama triangle, which is um, a, a victim rescuer, per persecutor rescuer. Those are the three roles. Um, I, I talk about it in the Coaching Habit book briefly. Um, 
And when you ask people to self-identify which of those three roles they think they play most often, rescuer, um, I'm sorry, victim, persecutor, rescuer, on average, like 90 to 95% of people self-identify as rescuer, which to me, honestly, is often the act of a victim, which is ironic. Um, but everyone's like, and now I'm, and I'm exhausted because of it, because it is an endless, fruitless attempt to be in save it mode, to be in rescuer mode. So you got the three, uh, two out of three done. We've got tell it and we've got save it. Let's talk about control it. Control it is the subtlest of the three advice monsters. Control it is kind of scuttling about in the shadows. And control it is saying, look, the way you win is you never give up control. You keep your hands on the steering wheel at all times. Make sure you control this from the start, through the middle to the end. If anybody else leans in, if anybody gets empowered, if anybody else shares control, then all that's going to do is create chaos. All that's going to do is let chaos in and dismantle everything. It's like a bad Avengers movie or something. So if that's control it, there are definitely some prizes for that behavior, ways that you win, not win. Short-term, more ego-driven, but what... Oh, Wrong thing. There we go. What do you think the prizes are for the control it behavior? Stealing the possibility of development uh, gets done my way for sure. Yeah, it's status again. It's control. It's certainty. Illusion of control. That's well said. Uh, get it done your way. Your comfort. Your total credit for sure. With control it, you're like, if this works, it's down to me. And if it doesn't work, it's those other turkeys that I have to work with that are dragging me down. Um, certainty, quality control, you get the credit, ego, power recognition. You guys are all over this. It's wonderful. And you can you can see actually how the same symptoms keep showing up, right? For tell it and save it and control it. These are different facets of the same behavior. Like all models, they just try and simplify a, a phenomena and kind of help us understand it in a different way. Um, if those are the prizes, what are the punishments? What's the price you pay and what's the price others pay when you're in control it mode? Isolation, disengagement, stress. Being in the past is a really good one. I think with control it, you eliminate the opportunity for serendipity you eliminate the opportunity of the future coming in and nudging you. You eliminate the opportunity of somebody going up, going, I've thought of a better idea <laughs> than you. I've, I mean, I work with people all the time and honestly, my favorite moments, and I have a bit of a control in me. This is control. It's probably the one that is strongest in me. Um, and there are sometimes I'm working with a, a contractor sometimes and I've given them a brief for something that I want them to do. And they come back and they have absolutely answered the brief and they've given me the answer that I was looking for. And I am always a little disappointed. <laughs> and sometimes I give it to somebody and they come back and they have absolutely answered the brief and they've answered it in a way that I could never have imagined myself. And I'm like, and that's why I'm going to hire you again, because that's amazing. And if you're too much in control, you eliminate that opportunity of somebody coming in and blowing your mind to find what they can bring. So these are fantastic. Smothering your client's creativity, eliminating the ahas. In the end, if you had to sort of pull all of this together, you can see that the short-term wins are so often about you, your ego, your status, your control, your authority, your privilege, the status quo, the fact that you get to be unchallenged and unchallenging, unthreatened and unthreatened, that you uh, keep things the way that they are. And one of the things that's just worth saying out loud is it's really helpful to acknowledge how committed we are to the status quo. Even though we talk up a good game about being up for change as coaches, we, we kind of like it. We kind of like the status quo because we're humans. And part of what you're doing in the prizes and punishments is you're uncovering that commitment to the status quo and seeing the price and deciding whether you want to pay that price and, and allow the benefits 
of managing the, the advice monster to come out. And we'll get into that to a second. That wasn't, that was a bit confusing, sorry. I'll have a go at that later on. Here's my question for you. You see, you see the three advice monsters, tell it, save it and control it. Here's what I wanna know. Which one presses your buttons? You had to pick one of those to say, yeah, this is the one that I know and I recognize. And Petra, let me call you on. I don't mean to embarrass you, but I'm interested to talk to you about it. Which one feels most real for you? I'm not sure if it's always the same, but um, the one that, that pops up quickly is save it, right? When you see someone struggling, it's like, oh gosh, you, 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 you feel like you're assuming that you know what that feels like right now, right? Yeah. You don't make that whatever you think is better. Um, but definitely uh, the whole idea of you want to add value, that definitely resonates. <laughs> so the control it, yeah. I mean, the, the tell it is definitely there, yeah. You no, know, and I'm seeing I'm seeing people naming it, but I'm also going, <laughs> but I'm but all of them, all of the above is part of it. And look, if you're interested, there's there is a quiz at theadvicetrap.com where you can take it. It's a short quiz; it'll take you five minutes or, or less. It's it's not scientific. I just made it up, but it's a way of you actually answering some questions, and it may give you some clue as to which of these advice monsters feels strongest for you. So if you'd like to check it out, I think it's free. It is free. Um. Here is the cancer that is really at the heart of the advice monster when your advice monster is there. And this is important for your clients, but honestly, I think it's important for our relationships in our day-to-day -day life as well. When your advice monster is in control, there's one fundamental message that comes through, which is you are better than them. You are smarter, wiser, more experienced, more knowledgeable, more competent, more, more able, you're more competent. You're just better than they are. And I'll just, I mean, it's really worth just pausing on this. So I don't, I don't muddy the waters. There's a place for advice. There's a place for solutions when it is a, when it is a choice, when you're going, this is the intervention that serves my clients or these people best. But if it becomes a habit, when your advice wants to take control before you know it, you've, you've, what Ed Shine would say is you've suddenly one up yourself on that other person. You've given yourself the status because you've said, I'm best here. I'm better than you are. And that is a corrosive place to continue to be. So this isn't just about being a better coach, although it's that as well. It's about what does it take to build relationships that are deeply nourishing. You know, I, I've read a little bit of Martin Buber's work, B-U-R-B-U-R, -R, I think is how you spell it. And he has a very simple model, um, which are often the best. And he says, there are two types of relationships. There are I, it, um, Buber, thank you, Scott, uh, B-U-B-E-R, um, I, it relationships and I, thou relationships. And I, it relationships, uh, this is my language, when you kind of lost sight of the humanity and the other person, they're a little bit of a, 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 a cog in the machine. They're a little bit of a puzzle to be solved. I think when, you're, when your advice monster's loose, you're in an I-it relationship. And an I-thou relationship is when you're kind of fully present with the humanity of the other person, which means you're also fully present with your own humanity in that. And it's from I-thou relationships that the, the, the deep, profound relationships grow. And I do think that this work to control your advice monster speaks to a commitment to show up in the most wholehearted way to be present in a relationship. Let me ask you this. Second time I'm asking it, so you know what I'm doing here. What's felt most useful from that section? What landed for you? What struck a chord? Telling us they're not right of active leadership. I thou. Yep, very nice. The I it, I thou stuff. Yeah, brilliant. Staying curious longer. Very good. Naming the monster, the corrosiveness. I'm better than you. Yeah, that I, I didn't come up with that. I was actually talking to Shannon, who's the CEO now at Boxer Crayons. And when she was reading the advice trap, she's like, I think this is what it's saying at the heart of it. I'm like, oh yeah, that's powerful to see that. 
um, praises and punishments, wisdom enters through the wound, not good leadership. Good. So there's a lot of stuff that's striking chords for people. So I, I love seeing that. Um, I, I, I'll just say, I'll just reiterate this one thing about the prizes and punishments, which is we're using it in the context of advice monsters and behavior, but you can use it for any choice. And I think it can be a really simple tool. You can just take this tool to all of your clients. And anytime they're leaning into a decision, you go, great. So what are the prizes and punishments for making that choice? And what do you think? Do the prizes outweigh the punishments or do the punishments outweigh the prizes? And that's a very powerful meta tool for you and your clients because it pulls them out of the hurly burly. It gets them to kind of look at that, kind of disassociate themselves and look at the problem um, and, and start making some choices that are not just kind of instinctive and in, in the moment. All right, in the, uh, we're going to take about 10 minutes and we're going to make a start on taming the advice monster. Um, and I use the word taming uh, deliberately because I, I don't think you ever get rid of it. I don't think it's kind of van vanquish or squash or kill off or dismantle your advice monster. I just think it's, it's if any of you have done uh, any of the work around taming your gremlin, it's a similar thing, you know, when they talk about that, um, they're like, your gremlin never goes away. Your inner critic kind of always natters on in the background there. It's, but it's about reducing it, diminishing it, and not being reactive to it, not being driven by it. So here's the thing I would like you to do. <laughs> Tracy's going, I love your slide deck. Thank you, Tracy. It's, it's very sophisticated, you can see. But I like it as, uh, this is, um, let me, let me, I'm just reacting to Tracy's comment about liking the slide deck. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a, a random detour. This will be useful for some of you, not useful for some of you. But in the chat box, here's what I want you to do. What have you noticed and enjoyed or appreciated about the way I have taught this tonight or I have facilitated this tonight? What are you seeing here that you can learn from and adapt as a coach, a facilitator, and a training? So my humor and my presence, my eye contact, I'm spending a lot of time looking at the camera for sure. The simplicity of it, the interactivity, the meta conversation, um, the eye contact involving us, the, the degree of that, the authenticity, the simplicity of it, the candid language, not reading slides, <laughs> the wine, yeah, thank you. Um, the lightness of it, my authenticity, great, thank you. No PowerPoint, um, the background, which is, it's actually a little. It's, a, it's actually a little thing on a fabric screen. It comes from California, actually. There's a company in California called Anyvu, A N Y V O O, and you can just upload an image onto fabric and then stretch it over a screen. Um, so, I, I'll I'll tell you my design. Some of my design principles in um, in setting this up. Um, but the first is one design principle is what's the least I can teach that would be most useful. One of the anxieties that we often have when we're in the teaching mode is like, I've got to prove that I'm, I'm worth it. You know, I've got 308 people here. I can't let them down. So let me show you how much I know just to prove that I'm adding value here. So what's the least I can teach that would be most useful. I try and bring that to my books and, and everything I do. It means stripping out content, it means feeling the same anxiety you feel when you don't let your advice wants to go, which is like, do I have enough? <laughs> will I be found? Will I be caught short? Will I be found out? Um, the second thing is to say, how do I try and share the spotlight as much as possible? So Petra for sure has helped me do that. But look how amazing our chat box has been. We've, we've had thousands of comments in the chat box. I mean, it's been nuts. It's been brilliant and it's been nuts, but it means that it's been much easier for you to be present with me and kind of engaged around that. Secondly, um, there's been those moments where I've broken it up and I've cleared the cache. I've just stopped and I'm going, let's stop what's been useful, what's been helpful, what's landed for you there. So I keep clearing space for more content to arrive. Um, and then the, th the, the third point is I'm like, I. I have to think of this as a performance. So I have to bring a certain degree of predictability to it. 
and a certain degree of unpredictability to it to keep you at the right level of, I know what's happening. I know we're going to be done before the top of the hour. I know that we're going to talk about some stuff that's useful, but like the whole slide thing is unexpected and different and it just is a little disruptive. And, and me thinking about how do I disrupt your expectations is one of the ways that I keep you engaged and keep this feeling like it's moving at a fair pace because we've been going an hour. And I bet for most of you, this hasn't felt like an hour long webinar so far. It hasn't for me, it's felt much quicker than that. And I hope that's true for you as well. But let's get going. Let's get going on this, how to tame your advice monster. Here's what I want you to do. And you don't have to put this in the chat box, although you can if, if you're super keen. I want you to confess. <laughs> I want you to move from the theory of this to the practice of this. Uh, and the WWW stands for who, when, and what. So I want you to pick a person in your life where you're like, this is when they, they, they bring my advice monster out. It might be a client, it might be somebody in your family, it might be somebody in your work. But pick somebody who you're like, no, this person. This person triggers it in me. I can feel myself getting twitchy about it. Um, and then I want you to pick a moment with that person where it really happens more rather than less. It's like when, when I come home from work at the end of the day and my spouse starts telling me what to do, when I have my, my Monday morning meeting with my team, this client when they start whining about the same problem they've been whining about now for three months. I don't know what it is for you. And like I say, share it in the chat if you'd like to do that. Don't share it if you, if you feel a little too, too personal or too private, that's fine as well. So that's who and when. And now I want you to name the what. What's your behavior? What specifically does it look like? when you're in that advice giving mode, whether it's tell it, save it or control it. What do you think? What do you say? What do you do? And what I'm hoping you're seeing is how this is moving from Yeah, I get this in theory to you're kind of feeling it now in your body a bit. You're kind of going, Oh, yeah, I'm I'm noticing that <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing how that's real for me right now. So really helpful for you to see, see what's going on and kind of name the behavior because mostly that's been unconscious. Mostly that's been reactive. You haven't seen that before quite as clearly as you're seeing it now. And of course, once you start seeing it, you start being in, in the ability to start choosing to change it or not but you only get to choose after you've weighed up prizes and punishments. So for that person in that moment, what are the prizes for you? What do you get from that behavior? This is you thinking through what we've, we've already talked about in terms of prizes and punishments genet generically for the advice monsters. But what do you specifically get with that person in that moment with this behavior? How do you get wins, not wins? put them in their place, reconfirm that they should pay me for another month's coaching, reconfirm that this person always does that, that's why they're so annoying, reconfirm that you're unappreciated in this relationship. Also, I mean, I'm just making stuff up here, but. So those are the prizes. But now let's talk about the price being paid by you and by them. That specific person, what's the price they pay for this behavior from you? And what's the, what's the price you pay from this behavior for you? I, I so appreciate what's being shared here. I mean, it's really powerful stuff. And now you're seeing that you're, you're at a crossroads. You get to make a choice. You're really weighing up the prizes and punishments. And you're like, which uh, do, the, do the prizes outweigh the punishments? Because if they do, 
you're like, I'm just going to carry on with this behavior. It's honestly, I get more out of it than I lose. But if you look at it and you go, the price they're paying and the price I'm paying outweighs those short-term wins, not wins that I get from this behavior, then I want to think about doing something differently. And my question for you might be, you know, what's the one thing that you could try? Experiment. It's an experiment. Next time this happens, and this, I'm, I'm priming you to think about it before it happens so you can test it out and see how it goes. What's one thing that you might choose to do differently? I think, because you're all coaches, and this is excellent, one of, the, one of your best bets is to ask a good question, to stay curious a little bit longer. And because you're all coaches, experience, less experience, doesn't matter. You, you've already got some of that mojo. So you may have a particular question you want to, to ask. You may want to stay silent. You may want to physically reposition yourself in a different way. You may want to reposition the conversation in a different place so it doesn't happen in the same context every time. But you may go, let me figure out what I can do as an experiment. And I want you to frame it as an experiment because here's what's brilliant about the idea of an experiment. An experiment is, the purpose of an experiment is to gather data. Gather data. You wanna learn from it. So a good experiment is small and it's safe and it generates data, whether it works or whether it doesn't work. So you don't wanna set up a behavior that has the, a, a strong possibility that this will blow up the relationship and bring it to an end. That's probably a bit too extreme. But if you have an experiment where you're like, you know what, I'm gonna ask this question and if it really works with them, that's gonna be fantastic. That's gonna tell me something. And if it doesn't really work with them, that's fantastic. That tells me something as well. And I'll try something else next time. So if you hold it loosely as an experiment, what it does is it takes the pressure off you going, I hope this solves the problem. This better be the solution. Because then in some weird way, you got entrapped by the advice monster again, which is like, I need to have all the answers. So now you're like, I get to be curious about how I manage with this moment. I get to see what might work and what might work. And it's all good. So uh, that's almost where I want to leave it. Um, you know, I'll say this, if you, um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Camille in just a second as a way of wrapping it up. Um, but a few things before we go. The first thing is I'd love you all to show Petra some, some love, not just because of the work that she's done in terms of organizing it, which has been huge, but being willing to kind of jump on and be the voice of us all as we've talked about that. So send her some love and appreciation as I'm doing. So thank you, Petra. That was amazing. Really nice to partner with you there. Um, if you're interested in connecting with me on socials, I don't, I don't hang out a whole lot there, but um, on Instagram and Twitter, I'm at MBS underscore works. And some of you might be in clubhouse. It's the new thing, what the young people are doing. And there, my it's, I'm there under my just my full name, M Bungay Stanya. So you can find me there as well if you're if you're on Clubhouse, and you can certainly connect if you'd like to. Camille, actually, let me let me ask you this. I know I'll call Camille up. We've covered a lot in the in the seventy minutes or so that we've been talking. So brilliant! Thanks for sticking at me. It's, I hope it's felt fast and fun and spacious, but yet we still seem to cover a whole lot at the same time. That's my, that's my goal. If you could pick one thing that you're definitely taking away that's felt most powerful for you, what's felt most useful or most valuable from the whole shebang in the chat box? <laughs> Perfect, thanks to the ICF chapters, exactly. The prize and punishment, the curious longer, brilliant, easy and hard change, brilliant, fantastic how selfish advice can be some of the time for sure. Uh, my job is not, I uh, miss that. It's all going so fast. Taming the advice monster. Uh, whew, so many good things coming through. I love seeing this. It's really excellent. Um, now stay on because you're about to find out how to get the, the missing word so that you can get your CCE credit. You know, the first part of it is snow. Maybe you want to take a guess in the chat box around what the missing word is. Is it snowman? Is it snowball? <laughs> 
Is it snow in Texas? Is it something else? Who knows what the missing phrase will be? But <laughs> will snow fall, snow day, snow cone, snow Eden, snow bank, snow day, snow bird. This is fantastic. Uh, maybe this, maybe this, oh, the word has nothing to do with snow at all. I don't even. It has absolutely nothing to do with snow. <laughs> there we go. Okay, well, I let us down the the wrong so, path. Then, or if, if you could uh, do me a favor and share the PowerPoint. Sorry, everybody, we're going to have a couple more PowerPoint slides. I know we just beat the heck out of PowerPoint. So to do, I think we're going to move into some Q and A. And I did notice a question in the chat that I think I'll just get us started with, if that's okay, Michael. Sure. Um, and I didn't catch the name of the person, but you know, the, the person said, I'm waiting for how to change a hard, move a hard okay. change. To I saw it too. How to move hard change into easy change. Into easy change, exactly. So I wanted to, I caught that and I thought, okay, well, let's start there. A really good question. And all I can say is I'm about to break your heart. <laughs> I don't think there is a, I think there, I, well, here's my experience. When I first started tackling hard change, the, the thing that was hard change for me was to build a high functioning team. Even though I had read every book on team building ever written, even though I literally ran courses on how to build a high functioning team, I just couldn't do it for myself. I just kept, I just kept colluding against my own ambition. It drove me nuts. And I worked through this process or a process like it to kind of work out prizes and punishments and um, figure out experiments to run to try and try out a new way of showing up in the world. And, and I broke the back of it, but I did it through practice. I did it through coming at it sideways and, um, and no longer throwing the easy change tactic, which is to read more books and just to keep hiring people and hope that I get it right until I figured out what my prizes and punishments were, which then allowed me to come at hiring and building a team in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. It is still difficult for me to do, to build a team. I don't find that easy, but I, but I, 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 I've somehow broken the back of the hard change. So I think it's working the process and then keep doing the work and stuff moves from hard change to easy change if you're lucky, mm -hmm. but it's not an easy switch in my experience. Mm -hmm. So here's what I'm going to thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate that. Sure. What I'd like to ask everyone to do, because the chat is moving like crazy, <laughs> is, is to maybe let's just pivot over to the Q&A right. box. So down, down below on, on the little uh, Zoom bar below you, you can see that there's a whole Q&A uh, thing there. Exactly. And we can keep the chat for the chat. And, and there are some nice comments coming through. So thank you, everybody. who Anybody who needs to ro roll off now and doesn't want to stick around for the Q&A, that's totally awesome. I'm going to share the two secrets of eternal happiness and wealth as part of the Q&A. So if you go, you miss that, but that's your choice. Um, but, we'll, but if you've got a specific question you'd like to ask me, and you're welcome to ask me pretty much anything. You, you're welcome to ask me anything. I may not answer everything, but you can ask it. Um, we'll put those in the Q&A, and we'll deal with those just to keep it separate. Okay. Michael? So what, there's a question yeah. coming in. What was your most successful experiment to start taming your own advice monster? Well, I use this. I, um, the, I've been working on taming my advice monster since actually going to university as an undergraduate. So that's 30 years ago about. Um, and I just noticed sitting in, in one of the, the kind of tutorial things that I was in that there were two guys and there were 10 women and the two guys of which I was one were doing an awful lot of the talking. And I just noticed at the time that that, that didn't feel that great. <laughs> and that was kind of the start for me around how do I uh, work on taming my advice monster. Um, and I'm, you can guess I'm pretty good at it most of the time with most of the people because it's, it's like a, almost a professional obligation. And there are still some people in my life who bring out the advice monster, like my brother, Nigel. <laughs> I love him and he's a good guy and there's nothing broken in our relationship, but he also drives me nuts. And if anybody wants makes my advice wants to go, just tell him stuff, it's Nigel. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just I, I show up to conversations with Nigel knowing that and going, 
you know, I thou relationship, Michael, not I it relationship. And some of the time that works. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, we have another question. I'm just taking them in the order in which sure. you're coming in. So just to keep it simple, how do you step in? When hey, Camille, I'm... let me just interrupt before you sure. finish that. That's the answer to the question. Okay. Because oh. the question is, how do you interrupt? What, what do you do when a person's talking and talking and you have to interrupt them? Okay. <laughs> so, sorry. A, That's okay. So the question was, if you can't see in the Q&A, how do you step in when a client is talking and talking and you have to interrupt? Here's what I do. I tell them I'm going to interrupt them. And for some reason that makes it happen. And if you're in person or you're Zooming with them, I'll often put up a finger, but I'll say something like, hey, Camille, I'm just gonna, just gonna stop you there. Hey, Camille, I'm just gonna jump in. Hey, Camille, let me just pause you because I wanna ask you this question. And for some reason, telling them that you're interrupting them makes the interruption okay because you're kind of giving them a kind of warning and an explanation of what's happening. And they're like, oh, okay, you're, you're interrupting me. That's what's happening here. So they know the process that makes it psychologically safe for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There we go. What is the connection between taming and vice monster and deep listening into an emergent future? I, um, so that's from Kieran. So Kieran, I think, um, I, I'm not sure I have a, a full answer to that because deep listening into an emergent future may mean something bigger than I can imagine. But I think if your advice monster is, particularly if control it is in, in, in the house, you're kind of fixing it in the here and now, and you're less open to possibilities. So I do think um, your advice monster assumes that you already know what the future is best. So why would we bother with any time spent on emergent stuff? So I think it gets in the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you assist coaches who are their own advice monster? So when I'm coaching, I spend time helping my people I'm working with to notice what I'm noticing. Mm -hmm. So I go, hey, Camille, it's, it's, I'm going to interrupt you for a moment. Uh, let me tell you something that I'm noticing. And this might be helpful for you or it might not. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I do a lot of moderating what I'm about to say so that if what I say doesn't land, we can both walk away from it without it breaking something. So I'm like, hey, Camille, let me tell you what I'm noticing here. It, this might be helpful. It might not. So Camille goes, that's not helpful at all. I'm like, yeah, I didn't think it would be. That's fine. Um, I'm noticing that you'll set yourself a challenge and then you'll like beat yourself to, to death with your own advice stick. You know, let me show you what I mean by that. You said this, and then you said this, this, and this, and then the other day you said this, and then you said this, this, and this. What do you reckon? How's that working for you? And then just hold it up and allow them to reflect on it. And it might land and it might not land. Mm -hmm. But I'm often trying to hold up a mirror going, hey, this is what I'm noticing. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, and then we have from Kathy... Can you give an example of the be, do, be process? I feel yeah, I, I understand. Frank Sinatra, do, be, do, be, do, be, do, be. So I, here, here, this is connected to, I'm writing a new book at the moment, which will come out uh, uh, early next year. And the premise of it is this. We unlock our best self when we take on hard things. And I hope that lands for people. You know, you, you step out to the edge of who you are. You're trying stuff that's new to you. It's difficult. It's unknown. It's messy. It's challenging. But you can feel yourself rising to meet the, the challenge. And I think that's what I'm trying to articulate, Kathy, which is you, you do stuff that's new to you. You, you, you experiment. You, you feel into the ambiguity and the qualities of you as you experiment in this new behavior, stuff that's already true about you has the opportunity to become more true. And the qualities you have become strengthened or nourished or reinforced or, or burnished in some way. That, that's not super articulate, but it's the best I've got at the moment. Thank you. And then from Gina, what are some of your favorite insightful questions when your advice monster wants to come out? 
Well, honestly, when my advice wants to, wants to come out, I'm not trying to be too clever. I'm just trying to stay curious. So it almost doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But if I had to have a go-to question that is the best self-management tool for an advice monster, it's simply, and what else? It just means that you're re-asking the question you already asked, and it gives you a chance to wrestle your advice monster while they're answering the question, and what else? Mm -hmm. And what else? Is there anything else? And what else is my go-to question as the, the fail-safe for um, managing your advice monster? Right. And then from Nagesh, who defines change as easy or hard? What I may see as hard change may be soft, or I'm going to say, I guess, easy change for the client or vice versa. How do we get the two to match? Yeah, I, um, I think it's entirely from the person who's wrestling with its perspective. It's like, is it easy change or is it hard change for you? If it's easy change, then you master it by knowing and doing and knowing and doing and getting on top of it. And you know, a great way of asking about hard change is, have you tried this before and struggled with it and really not made much progress? And if you're like, yup, and you're like, that's probably hard change. Yeah, that's great. I love that distinction. Okay, and Margaret. And we're going to keep going, you guys, until for another few minutes, okay, before we, uh, you know, call it a day. But uh, this is great. So we'll just keep going. Uh, do you have any tips for helping someone who is stuck in their status quo, experiments, questions, et cetera, to get to the hard change? Um, so, so. That's a broad question, Margaret, and I suspect there's more behind it that you haven't put in the question because you, you've got somebody in mind, perhaps. Um, I think the steps for me are, first of all, have you defined the hard change challenge in a way that feels real and vivid and important to you? You know, is the thing that you're wrestling with really the thing? Um, and, you know, that the question, you know, what's the, so what's, what's the real challenge here? What's the hard thing here? What's the difficult thing that we're really trying to crack here? They're all useful questions because sometimes just figuring out what the real challenge is, is a, a breathtaking moment and, and a real breakthrough for people. And that can be really powerful. Mm -hmm. And I do I think, something, just yeah. because when you say that question, what is the real challenge for you, I think that yeah. that really, you know, this is about you. <laughs> That's right. I mean, it's not what's the, what's the challenge here. It's what's the real challenge here. But it's not just what's the real challenge here. It's what's the real challenge here for you. Mm -hmm. It keeps bringing back on the how's this hard for you in this moment. Right. And then, Margaret, I think honestly, there is just I think the um, a wrestling with prizes and punishment on this current behavior might be the place that I tend to go to. And if it's frustrating for you that they're not taking this on, maybe there's work there for you to do around managing your frustration with that other person. Cause they may be going, honestly, I'm happy with not solving this problem. Perfect. Now I will tell you, Nanor has said that there are a few people who have raised their hands. So I'm wondering why don't we just kind of shift over to some people who have raised oh. their hands and they can ask their own questions. Yeah, let's do that. All right, there are a lot of questions here. Okay. So there, Nanor, what, you may want, since you see who those people are, you may want to come off camera and- While, while you're doing that, I'm going to answer some questions really quickly. Okay. Is, is Nigel my older or younger brother? He's my middle brother. I have a younger brother called Gus. Um, how do you handle the situation when you're the recipient of an advice monster lovingly? I get increasingly unloving and I go, hey, you know what? This, this advice is less useful than you might think <laughs> <laughs> because um, at a certain point, I'm like, let's try and just break the pattern. Pete, I think you're up. Mm -hmm. What do you got for me, Pete? You'll need to go off mute unless you want me to read your lips of your photo. <laughs> There you there go. Go. Yeah. Okay. Um, question with your family, you're not supposed to coach them other than once to just to let them know what coaching is like, and you don't want to give them advice. 
So what do you do between those two polar extremes? And I know you coach them once so they know what it is, but then you yeah. never coach them again. Well, here's what I try and teach people because I mostly teach people who aren't coaches. And I say, I don't want you to be a coach. I want you to be more coach-like. So I don't need you to formally coach me. I just want you to stay curious. So I'm like, just, you know, my wife from the very start, when I did my coach training 20 years ago, she's like, if I ever catch you coaching me, you are dead to me. I will literally kill you in your sleep. Do not coach me. And I'm like, okay, that's really clear boundaries. Thank you, Marcella. But, um, but I ask her questions and I'm like, sometimes coaching can go like the way I prove my value as a coach is we've solved it or we've fixed this or something and we've made progress. Um, whereas when I'm talking to people who I love and who are close to me, uh, I'm actually going, I'm just curious as to how we might, how, how I might be helpful here, how this conversation might be helpful for you. So I don't call it coaching, but I ask, I ask a bunch of questions to people who are in my life. Awesome. Lenora, I think we can probably take one more and then, cause I'm just kind of trying to keep an eye on the time sure. here for everyone. So it looks like sure. Shelly is up. Yes. So Shelly, if you want to take yourself off mute. Well, oh, Shelley, okay. Shelly, perfect. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, How are you? I, I don't know. What would you want me to do? I was like looking um, at the you had You had raised your hand. Did you have a question, Shelly? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I did not. No problem. <laughs> okay. That was inadvertent. No so, no um, there's, a, there's a question in the Q&A from Scott. I'm curious. How have you changed after becoming a rock star in the field? <laughs> well, you know, I've been divorced six times. I bought a fast car. This is all hair implants. I'm actually bald. Um, I, you know, how have I changed? Uh, I'm, I've become more ambitious. I've become more ambitious for the impact that I want to have because what's the, what's the next stretch goal for me becomes bigger because I've had some success like writing a successful coaching habit book. And that's given me some financial ability to then go, right, how do I now, where's the next edge for me? What's the next worthy goal that would be exciting for me? So that's not so much a change of who I am fundamentally, but it just means that I think differently in terms of the scope that I'm trying to have in the work that I do now. Great. Thank you so much, Michael, for taking the time to answer all these questions. And thanks to everyone who has submitted them. I wish we could have gotten to all of them. I'm sorry, yeah. Nanor, would you be willing to please bring up the PowerPoint? Just a couple more slides, everybody. Of course. Thank you. My computer is going a little bit slower, so pardon. Okay. While it's coming up, I just want to appreciate all the nice comments that are in the chat. There's lots of people saying nice things, so I'm really happy for you that you stayed, stuck around. I'm glad so many of you found it useful. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, I'll see some of you in the year of Living Brilliantly, which is this uh, free program that we offer at mbs.works. Sign up there. It's a really rich community. Yes, and now no, we're not seeing your the slides. We're seeing that you're sharing your screen, but I'm not. We're not seeing slides. So, oh, okay. Um, ah, there we go. Awesome. So here okay. is the yes. Here is the uh, URL for the year of living brilliantly. Um, I will just tell you that myself, I have actually been a part of this program for I think forty about forty two weeks, <laughs> and I learned about it. and It's been great. So um, definitely check it out. Yeah, it's 52 different teachers. There's a new teacher every week. They share a five, a two to six minute video. And it's just, I just asked 52 of my best friends going, teach me the best thing you've got. And it's rich and it's diverse. And um, some, of the, some of the teachings will really strike you, strike a chord and some not so much. But I reckon most people are finding like 70 to 80% of what they, they learn has been really powerful for them. And it's a big community, like six or 7,000 people there. So it's a really rich place to hang out. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. And I think to close out, I'd like to ask Greta to come onto um, screen and unmute herself and maybe take us out. Yeah. So again, just want to thank Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. 
Thank you for all the chapters that have participated to to, to to bring you here. And mostly thank you for the great audience. Thank you for your participation. This has been great. So we wish you all a happy night. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and may you all go in peace. Mm -hmm. So I hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a good work with you all. See you next time. Bye-bye.